Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Ron Aguilera. I am the executive pastor here at Crosswalk Redlands. I am also the director for mission expansion for Crosswalk Global. And I've got my friend with me. Hey, I'm Brian Rodriguez. I am a lead for Crosswalk Español, and I am also a volunteer coordinator here, uh, helping scheduling, staffing for the uh, cafe and first impressions teams. Now, we're very excited to be here with you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, and I'm excited to welcome back Pastor Ron. I feel like you've been gone for my life forever. T tell us about everything you've been up to. Yeah, it's been crazy. Spent uh, two, two weeks, uh, two Saturdays launching our Crosswalk Jakarta campus. So pretty exciting, all the stuff that's going on there. About 300 people joined us for both of those Saturdays. So, man, that was fantastic. 300? Yeah. 300 great worship uh, team there, and they they jumped right in. It, it was fantastic. That's amazing. Now, don't bury the lead, though. You had a major life milestone before. Well, there's that, right? I was kind of sweating a little bit because my uh, first grandchild was born. My granddaughter was born to my daughter a week before I had to leave, and I was sweating it like, if it's going to be late, I may miss it because <laughs> I had to go to Jakarta, but uh, blessed and she celebrated a month here just, uh, you know, last Tuesday. Amazing. Yeah. So all sorts of major moments happening. Now, going yeah. back to the Jakarta piece, it feels like the Lord is really propelling our campus and our yeah. network. Yeah. So many new expansion points are popping up. Yeah. So not only do we now have eight campuses, soon to be 10 by, by this summer, but we also have these Lovewell communities, which are aspiring campuses. And if you want to know about those, you're watching online and you're close to one of these locations, uh, check it out because it's an opportunity for you to be close to one of these communities, right? We have campuses not only here in Redlands, but we have campuses in Chattanooga, Portland, North Houston, New England. Yeah, New England. That, I've got a heart for New England. I was just most recently there. I feel like I've been at a couple different crosswalk campuses now, but yeah, if you're in the Boston area, th there's a lot of momentum there with the Lovewell Boston community. Yeah. And so I personally would encourage you to join up if you're in that area. Yeah. So uh, you'll notice that if you go to our website and you'll click locations and under there, you'll see our campuses, including our two international campuses, the Melbourne and, of course, our most recent one in Jakarta. But if you hit other, it'll show the Lovewell communities that are meeting. And there's one in Boston. There's one in Hartford. There's three here in Northern California or Central California, Sonora, Sacramento, and the Silicon Valley. There's one that's developing or just begun in Costa Rica. Whoa, that sounds incredible. In Espanol. Yeah, that sounds like an Espanol thing. And since you are our lead for Crosswalk Espanol, tell us a little bit about kind of what's going on here on that. Absolutely. So incredible uh opportunity. It's been a dream here locally for a long time. And Tim uh, invited me to join the ministry and spearhead it last year um, and did a lot of awesome growing as a team, getting everyone off the ground and understanding kind of what was the next steps. And this year we're already off to a strong start, met in January. And if you're here in the Redlands Loma Linda area, I'd love to personally invite you to join us on April 12th, Friday night. We're having our next Crosswalk Espanol gathering. Um, yeah. and, and it's just coming in the middle of a busy season. We're yeah. uh, just packed right now. We've got Easter coming up in a yep. week, and we're through our invitation series right now. Yep. The experience series starts after that, and then there's the Crosswalk Conference. And if you haven't signed up for that, want to invite you to do that. You can do that on our website. It's going to be fantastic. Worship night on Friday night. Saturday night, Scott the Painter will be here. So if you sign up, ticket is included for that as well. So a lot going on. We're just so happy you're, you're, you're tuning in. Pastor Taylor, our worship arts pastor, is, actually, is the one speaking today. I think you're going to find a fantastic message. So we're going to go there right now. Again, thanks for joining us. Walk. 
I'm so glad I remembered it was afternoon already. Um, it's so good to see you guys today. Um, before we start our worship moment right now, I just wanted to say that if you're coming here um, with just something to celebrate today, you know, praise God for that. And if you're coming in here with a hardship on your mind and you just feel burdened, I just want to remind you that praise is something that we do to remind us of the text in the Bible that God's promises never fail. And in the battle of Jericho, even then, the Israelites, what they did was sing praises on that last day and God fought their battles for them. So as we sing, I want you guys to pour out your hearts with us today um, and declare all of his promises out loud with us. Why don't we stand? We pray. 
worship him just as if we were in heaven already. He's getting closer.
So with Easter coming up, we actually have a new song that we're introducing today. And it's such a timely song. And it's one of my new favorites. So even if you don't know it, if you can take time to just dwell on the words. Uh, once you start getting used to it, I do invite you guys to sing along. Pour your hearts out with us today.
there's nobody. I want to hear you guys one more time. No enemy can hold you down because there's no There's nobody brave now. No enemy can hold you. Cause there's nobody in the grave now. What a beautiful song. Why don't we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you did and how it still applies to us today. You still love us today. Your blood, it still, still works. Um, Lord, I just ask for your blessings upon us, for you to fight our battles, for you to be able to comfort us in our times of hardship, in times of need, and help our, our ears be open today to just hear your word out. Lord, we love you. Amen. Hello, Crosswalk. Welcome to our noon program. And anyone who's tuning in online, so glad to have you here with us, joining this community belonging from wherever you're streaming. Um, friends, for those of us here in the Redlands campus, we're uh, dealing with a little bit of weather. And I, I, I've been getting told that it may have been my fault because this morning I was claiming that there would be sunshine, that the rain would not hit us. And, and, and it looks like the rain is winning out right now. I'm personally nervous too because the rain doesn't cooperate very well with my hair. And as you can see, there's a lot of it. It's very difficult to keep it in place. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes leaving uh, the, the, the church building today. But very excited to be together today to worship and, of course, to uh, talk about some of the things going on here at Crosswalk Redlands. A couple things. First, y'all may we y'all may recall a couple of weeks ago we were gonna have a ministry fair, uh, but we had to reschedule due to some uh, weather as well, and so um, that is coming up. April six is gonna be here. Uh, in the courtyard and it'll be happening throughout the church day but we would love for you to make a little bit of time in your calendars to just go to the courtyard and get to kind of know what's going on if you have been feeling impressed or perhaps curious even about how to get involved at a deeper level here with this campus uh, that'll be a perfect opportunity for you to kind of go and connect with the different ministry leaders and find out more about what it means to be a part I know I would love some more greeters for first impression so if you have been interested in that we would love to have you join us on our first impression squad the rumors are that we're looking for some more production folks too and there's all sorts of opportunities so yeah we would love for you to make time for that it'll be in the courtyard april 6. now the second thing um wanted to make a personal invitation to y'all we we have mentioned, right, there's a Crosswalk Conference coming up next month. It's going to be amazing. Campus people from uh, the Crosswalk Global Network will be coming to Redlands, and it's going to be an awesome three-day uh, event, um, April 19th through the 21st. On April 20th, Saturday evening, Scott Erickson will be here with us and wanted to extend a personal invitation to y'all. Uh, he is an author, an artist, and a performance speaker who is giving a uh, visual vocabulary to, to spirituality. And so details are behind me. Um, we would love for you to join us for that. It's going to be really amazing. If you're curious to learn more, there is more information on our website as well. So do make it a point to come out. It's going to be incredible. Now, today here with us, uh, we have a very special speaker. Pastor Taylor P. Bartram is going to be speaking to us, and we are in week six of the Invitation Series. So today we continue that journey.
Good morning, Crosswalk. How's it going? What's, what, Tim, what do you say? What's happening, Crosswalk? That's it. What's happening, Crosswalk? It's good to be with you today. My name is Taylor Bartram. I am the worship pastor here in Redlands, um, and I oversee our music and production teams. These are the teams that go into making all of this happen on a Saturday morning, um, and they do it. Amen. Yeah, you can go ahead and give, your, give you a round of applause for those teams. Um, they do an awesome job, and I'm, I'm privileged to lead them, but a lot of times you'll see me up here with a guitar, uh, maybe up here talking, calling you guys to worship, or you'll see me running around behind the scenes, um, but I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share with you today. And as we mentioned, we are in week six of the Invitation series. Uh, we're going to be sitting in Good Friday and the Crucifixion story today, and next week we will move on to the last week, and that's our Easter um, celebration. So now's probably a good time to a little plug for Easter weekend and everything that's going on. Um, as normal, it's a full weekend um, of events happening here at Crosswalk for Easter. So Friday night, we're going to start with a worship uh, in the interstitial space, the courtyard. That's the word everyone knows, courtyard. Um, in the courtyard at 7 p.m., John Ciccarelli is going to be sharing with us uh, on communion, uh, the Last Supper, and it'll be a real intimate worship space, as intimate as 400 people, 300 people can be. Uh, but we're excited for that event. Pray that it does not rain like I think it is outside right now. Um, so pray that the rain holds off so we can gather. And then Saturday morning, uh, all the normal times, 9, 10, 30, noon, um, but the services will be slightly different than normal. We've been preparing for a few months now um, for our Easter services, so that's a lot to look forward to. Um, and then lastly, uh, don't show up here on Sunday morning for a sunrise service because we are not having one <laughs> this year. Um, and that is because we have a little thing called Crosswalk Conference happening three weeks after um, so we wanted to be able to give our production and music teams, all of our teams, just some space to breathe, uh, make things a little bit easier this year. So no Sunday sunrise service. Uh, if you show up here, you'll be with citizens, which it'll be a party. Come through, come through for that. Um, so that is our Easter weekend events. And, and you've probably heard us say this. Uh, we said this coming into the series and we've said it throughout. Uh, but we, we are looking at God's invitation to us, but also um, we want to focus on our invitation to others that we extend uh, to engage in the gospel story. Um, and I don't know what that's looked like for you throughout the series. Maybe for some of you, it's uh, studying scripture, Bible study, uh, going through the series guide together. Or maybe you've invited some people to church, or if you're online uh, and you've been following with us, maybe it's, it's looked like a watch party. Um, but this Coming Easter, this is the time to cash in on that. Um, make good on those invitations. Invite a friend, bring people. Um, we are looking forward to the celebration. Um, so today, as I said, we're going to be focusing on the Good Friday story, the crucifixion. And I'm glad that we get a full service to sit in uh, this story because not always, but sometimes we can rush past the crucifixion um, and Good Friday to the joy that is Resurrection Sunday. And it, it is a joy. Um, it is a joyous event to rush forward to. But I think we lose something when we skip past or just breeze through the crucifixion. And make no mistake, it is a somber and a dark day in history, but it's one that is lined with hope. Um, and we're going to look at that today and through the lens of invitation. So um, it, it, this is not complex math or a complex equation. There are two parts to an invitation. <laughs> there is the sending of the invitation, um, and there is the receiving or the response of the invitation uh, or the response to the invitation. And we saw a good example of that in our bumper video, which Nico did a great job on the video that played before we got up here. Yeah, go ahead, clap for Nico. Why not? Nico does all of our videos. He does a great job. But in this, in this video, he, he portrays uh, the sending of an invitation and the responsibility that rests upon those who receive the letter to show up at this doorway, which you'll find out what's on the other side of the doorway if you come to Easter. So there's just a little uh, incentive. Come through, find out what's on the other side of the doorway. Um, but we, we also receive invitations in our lives, maybe not always letters, um, Maybe it's emails, maybe it's other things. And, and sometimes things get in the way of us responding to the invitation or the communication. So what are some areas that you struggle responding in? 
I got some horrific news. I don't know, horrific news is the way to say it. So God placed this on my heart today that there's some of you within the sound of my voice that need to hear this. If you have tens of thousands of unread emails, get help. <laughs> Just get help. Kenny, sorry, man, wherever Kenny Miranda's at. Um, I didn't know this was possible. In the first couple services, I said, yeah, if you have like a couple hundred unread emails or a couple thousand, Kenny has 90,000 unread emails. Kenny's great at responding. I just kind of, threw, Kenny's great at follow through. He's great. Does anyone have more than 90,000 unread emails? I start, I just put you on the spot. You're like, I'm not going to confess to that. Nobody. Okay. Kenny, sorry. You're our example for today. Go get help. Um, so emails, sometimes things get in the way of responding to that, or maybe it's phone calls or texts. You don't, you know, get nervous about talking on the phone or, or maybe some things like confrontation are difficult to respond to. And we put that off. Um, so I wonder, are there some things or times that there are things that prevent us from responding to God? And I'm not going to lie, as I type this question uh, in my notes, I felt a little bit weird typing that. Um, because when I hear this question or things of this, this nature, I feel like it's usually conveying this idea that like God is hard to find or hard to approach or we have to find the exact code uh, or the, the, the perfect equation to, to reach God and that does not sit well with me. When I think about Romans 8.38, this is what I lean into. It says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And this is good news. And I believe this to be true, that nothing can separate us from God's love. But there are things that can interfere in our, our relationship with God and our spiritual lives. There are things that can get in the way and kind of throw off that relationship. And, and the first thing is uh, sin. And that may sound a little aggressive, um, but, but sin can get in the way. It can interfere with how we are responding or relating to God. And we see that in Scripture, too. Um, one thing I want to make clear is that sin does not actually separate us from God to the point where we cannot approach him, and it doesn't keep God from approaching us. But also make no mistake, he doesn't want it to stay. He doesn't want it to remain. We see stories in scripture where he heals someone or he performs a miracle and he says, go and sin no more. So while it doesn't keep us from approaching God and vice versa, it is something that can interfere with how we relate. Um, sometimes other people can interfere. We saw in the story of Jesus flipping uh, the tables in the temple. Um, we looked at that in this series, and they had created this, this system um, that was extorting people. You know, they came to this temple to offer sacrifices, and if you brought a dove or whatever you brought, um, they would say, ah, that's not quite good enough, but you can buy this one for a premium price. Um, anyways, they had set up a system that was restrictive, that was keeping people uh, from um, interacting with God, engaging with him. And the third thing is our own thoughts, our own beliefs can interfere. Uh, maybe it's poor theology um, or incorrect theology, or maybe it's self-defeating thoughts or, or lies that we bought into that I'm not good enough, that I have done too much that I can't approach God. Or we think the other way that God would not want to approach me. So there's a lot of things that can get in the way of us responding to God's invitation and connecting with him. But here's, here's our question for today. It's how far will Jesus go to remove obstacles for us to come to him? So we're going to start in Luke 23. Uh, if you've been journeying with us, we've been in the book of Luke for this series. And uh, last week, Tim touched on uh, some events leading up to the crucifixion, uh, the Gethsemane scene, the Last Supper, and Peter's denial. And we're actually going to kind of skip through a little bit of, of our, our uh, Luke 23 passage today uh, where Jesus goes to Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod, back to Pilate, and he's convicted um, and sentenced to death. And that's what we're going to pick up today as he is on his way to Golgotha. In verse 32 of Luke 23, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his left and one on his right. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. 
and the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Now, Jesus' plea here for forgiveness is not directed towards uh, the two criminals that are there with him. We kind of moved past some of the events that led up to the crucifixion, but he's, he's praying for forgiveness over those who have been mocking him, who have humiliated him, who have, who have sent him to be crucified, the ones who cried out, crucify him. We want Barabbas, but take Jesus. So this is who his prayer is over. And what I love about this moment is that it, it gives us a really good picture to the heart of Christ and ultimately the heart of God. And that when these people have no clue what their actions are, they, they, don't, they do not understand what they're doing. Christ does not hold that against them. And not only does he not hold it against them, he goes ahead of them to pray for mercy and forgiveness that they might have a way back to him. And I think we're not immune to this. Sure, there's times in our lives as well um, where we are partaking in things that we're unaware of that may be drawing a divide. And the application for this for us today is that just as Christ went before these people, he, he, when they had no clue what was happening, he said, forgive them. He does the same for us and is removing obstacles for us to come to him even when we are unaware. It's the, it is the grace of God that allows for repentance. And God is constantly making ways. Now, I, I say this carefully because I don't want us to feel like we need to live in fear and like always looking over our shoulders, like, am I doing something wrong? Am I, is this thing a, a problem? We do not need and we should not live in fear. We don't have a spirit of fear of timidity, but of power of confidence. So this points to God's goodness that he's making pathways back to him. Let's pick up in verse 35. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? For we deserved to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This part we know really well. Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. So there's a lot of irony here in uh, the insults and the humiliation and everything that's being said to and about Christ. And, and that they're saying, he, this guy can't, he, he says he saves people, but look at him now. And the irony is that it's by not saving himself that he is saving them. And what we see here is that even in Jesus's death, he's creating pathways. He's clearing the way for people to reach him, for people to return to him. Verse 44, by this time, it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. So there's a lot to unpack here, uh, more than we have time for today. And uh, if, if you go look at commentaries or different things that scholars say about this passage, I mean, there is loads of significance tied into each of these things. And, and really, these are all supernatural significant things. I mean, you look in each gospel, I and mean, Matthew says that people came out of the grave. <laughs> They literally, the dead were resurrected. Um, so this was an incredible event, um, and there's a lot of significance packed in here, but let's, let's look at a few of these things. So uh, Jesus was laid on the cross and, and died around noon, and he died relatively quick. If you know anything about the crucifixion, um, you know that it was very uh, intentionally designed to be a slow and painful death. And by slow, I mean like days I mean, this was, this was meant to draw out agony and suffering as long as possible, in addition to being incredi incredibly humiliating. 
Um, so Jesus' death came very quickly, and there's different thoughts on that. The weight of the world's sin rested upon him, or it was the separation from his father. But either way, this is abnormal. And then we see that the sky goes dark for three hours, and then the curtain was torn from the top down. So um, I don't know how much you know about the curtain. Um, if you've read in our study guide for this series, you'll, you'll see there's some details that we've provided in there about it. But it, it took about 100 priests to take this thing down and to clean it. It was several feet thick. So this wasn't just like your curtains that we have hanging up over here, your, your living room or bedroom curtains. Um, this thing was massive um, and probably couldn't be torn by human hands, let alone torn from the top down. And this curtain separated the most holy place from the holy place. So it's, it's also important that we understand the temple system. Um, so the temple system at the time was given to them by God, given in the Old Testament. We can read about that. Um, but this temple system did not allow for easy access for your common person to God. See, there was a courtyard, the outer courtyard that your, your common people could be in. In the next stage, you had the, the holy place where your priests have access to. And then beyond that, you have the most holy place or the holiest of holies. Um, and this is where only the high priest could go once a year on the day of atonement um, to intercede for his people. Um, so the tearing of the curtain here is clearly incredible just by by the numbers of ripping this massive curtain, but it's also signifying something very important. And what it's signifying is that the former era, an old era has passed and a new one has arrived where we don't have to show up to a specific temple with a priest, bring a sacrifice to have access to God, but that we now have that. And we're going to get into this too as we go into the Acts series and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But a new era has been ushered in with the tearing of the veil at the death of Christ. And moving on here to verse 46. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went away, they went home in deep sorrow. See, even in Jesus's death, his countenance was convincing people that they should follow him. The Roman officer alone gives us something significant to look at. Now, I, I get it. There's all these crazy things happening at the time of Jesus's death. Dead people are coming out of the tomb. I mean, it's sky goes dark. All of these things happen. And I can see if I'm the officer that I could see like, Man, this is, cr I would be cowering in fear. But what's so significant to me is that he's moved to worship. He didn't just recognize this man is, is special, but he responded with, Worship And the whole crowd recognized that something significant had happened that day. And what was significant is that death had been defeated once and for all. That we might have a way to the Father. I'm going to share this quote from Jürgen Moltmann. My theology professor would be super proud right now. He says, in God's eternal purpose, it is God himself who is rejected in his son, this is the part I love, for God wills to lose that many may win. Now, there's a lot we could unpack uh, theologically in this quote um, from his book, uh, this, the, the Crucified God. Uh, but, but I love this line, that God wills to lose that we may win. So I have three takeaways as I reflect on this passage. And the first is that God extends the invitation. And while he cannot choose what our response, what anyone's response will be, he removes every obstacle that he can. And this answers our question uh, that we had earlier, top of the service. How far will Christ go? We've seen him uh, flip tables. We've seen him overturn systems of injustice and extortion. Um, we've seen him... Uh, validate others' actions in the story of the widow with two mites and, and 
we've seen him remove obstacles. And the answer to this question was probably obvious as I asked it at the beginning, but we clearly see in this story um, that he will even take on death. Second takeaway is nothing now stands in the way of us accessing God, not even death. And this is shown in the dramatic event of the tearing of the veil of the temple curtain. As we said earlier, this, this ushered in a new era where, where we no longer have to show up at a physical temple. And we get the privilege of, of being here at church together and, and church and faith community is vital to our lives, to our experiences um, as Christians. We don't have to show up at some temple anymore and bring a, a physical animal to sacrifice because Christ has filled that role. We don't have to have a priest there to intercede for us because we have Christ interceding for us now. So what takes the place of that temple? We take the place of that temple. We don't have to go somewhere because we are walking temples and God desires to fill us as he filled the temple back then. We're going to see this as as we get into Acts and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but God desires that he would dwell within us, that his spirit would fill us. This is the third point. If you want to know God, if you want to know what he's like, start with Jesus. Christ said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And if you want to know what the heart of God is like, you can look at Jesus, but the best place to start, I believe, is at the crucifixion. We see that the greatest love, there there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your brother. And Christ exemplifies that here by laying down his life for us. See the cross, and we boil it down to this oftentimes, but it's a, I'm in or I'm out. Have I accepted God? Have I responded to the invitation? And if I have, then I'm in. I'm good, I've arrived. And if I haven't, then I have not arrived yet. And make no mistake, eternity is a a part of accepting this invitation. But accepting the invitation is also stepping into new life here and now. As Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is here and now, but so too is new life that we might step to that. So I don't have some grand altar call to make, but I do have one hope. And that's my hope that everyone here who's joining us online would respond to this invitation with a yes. And this invitation is extended every day, no matter how many times we've accepted it or denied it. The invitation is here that Christ brings it to us constantly. So maybe this is your first time hearing this story. Um, Maybe it's the first time that this story has touched you in in a powerful way. Amazing. How can you not respond as the soldier did in worship, in awe? Or maybe, maybe you've been, you know, walking lockstep with God. You're like, man, we're good. We're homies. We're good. Maybe he's calling you deeper to faithfulness and to intimacy, or maybe like we've been advocating for, like we've been pushing throughout the series, God is saying, hey, um, you know me, but so-and-so doesn't. And it's time to set your life up as an altar, as an example for others of my faithfulness. And it's time to go invite others into this story, into resurrection life. So wherever we are, this invitation applies to us. I want to finish off with a quote here, the Jürgen Moltmann quote. Get bonus points in my class if I was still in my, the under, my undergrad theology course. It says, yet only the crucified Christ can bring the freedom which changes the world because it's no longer afraid of death. I love this, uh, the song that we sang before, Nobody. Um, it encapsulates this well that we... <laughs> There's no body in the grave and we do not need to fear death for Christ has gone to the greatest lengths to remove even death as an obstacle. 
And I think about the centurion, I think about this soldier, and I find myself in his place that no matter how many times I read this story, I can recognize that this was a significant man, that he was no normal man, but that he truly was the Messiah and he is worthy of my, my yes, my praise, my worship and response. Let's pray crosswalk. God, we are here with profound gratefulness for what you've done that you don't just work to, to remove small obstacles, but you go the distance to remove even death, that we might respond to you, that we might step into new life, that we might step into eternal life, but that we also might step into a new life here and now, that we might live out of the freedom, out of the truth, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So God, today we wanna worship and respond by giving you all our praise and adoration for you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Invite you to stand and worship with this crosswalk. Come 
Crosswalk, thank you for joining us today. One last reminder of our Easter services coming up next weekend, Friday night at 7 in the courtyard, uh, same time on Saturday, 9, 10, 30 at noon with some special services. Um, we would love to see you there. No Sunday, unless you want to party with citizens, but uh, you're welcome to do that as well. So hope to see you guys there. As always, thank you so much for choosing to make this place your church home and for your continued generosity. Um, and your giving, your faithful giving that makes this all possible. Um, everything that happens in here on a Saturday morning and, and out there in our other buildings throughout the week to your giving makes that possible. So thank you so much. Um, if, if you're new or maybe you're just getting a little bit more connected and you're interested in getting plugged in in that way, uh, scan the QR code on the screen and that will take you to our website um, where you can get connected there. Uh, as we conclude, we're gonna have our prayer team up here and if there's good things going on in your life that you just want to pour out praise and thank God for our prayer team is here for that. If there's difficult things that you just need someone to pray over you for, they've got you there. Um, they are happy to do so with you. So come forward to the prayer team uh, as we conclude. And as always, Crosswalk, as we go out into our Saturday and our weekend and our week, go out and love well. Thank you so much.